Thank you. Mike, okay in the back? Cool. Okay. So what I want to tell you about today is this homotopy type theory project that I and many other people have been working on. So this project is about connecting dependent type theory with two areas of mathematics, homotopy theory and higher category theory. And for today's talk, I'm definitely not going to assume that you know what these things are, though I will assume that you didn't know <laughs> what the top thing is because dependent types are in a lot of the tools and programming languages that we've developed and used in this community, proof assistants like Coq and Agda and New Pearl, Lean, the Lean Theorem Prover, programming languages like Idris and Fstar, and more and more these days, even Haskell has some flavor of dependent types. So the idea with dependent types, generally speaking, is that you have types that can depend on programs or refer to programs, and we've seen many talks over the course of the week about how you can use this to do program verification, how you can use this to check invariance of programs, how you can use this to do, uh, another thing you can do with this is do mechanized mathematics. We saw that a little bit yesterday. And so that's the kind of thing this stuff is good for. And this homotopy type theory project began with some surprising semantics, taking dependent type theory, that is a type theory where you have these kinds of dependent functions, types that depend on values, and interpreting it in these mathematical settings. So you can take the rules of type theory and regard them as saying things in these mathematical settings. So this was first uh, noticed in around 1994 by Hoffman and Streicher, and then over the course of the next 15 years, people kind of elaborated this correspondence and generalized it so that it talked about more of this structure of higher category theory and homotopy theory. And then the cool thing from our point of view as functional programmers is that eventually very smart people started to realize that this semantics suggested new things that we could add to the type theory that are motivated by or only exist in these mathematical settings. Okay, so what I wanna to do today is to investigate what these new principles are that we can add to type theory and think about that. So one thing you can do with these new principles is you can use functional programming as a language for talking about these mathematical structures. So this thing here that I've drawn a picture of is something called the Hopf vibration, which is a non-trivial map from the three sphere to the two sphere. And the cool thing is that with homotopy type theory, we can describe this higher mathematical object by writing a functional program. And it doesn't really matter what's going on in the details of this. I don't expect that you'll get that, but like you can maybe see the shape of it, which is there's some case analysis, is, analyses and there's a lambda and we're writing some functions and in a few lines of code you can describe this mathematical thing you can prove things about it and one of the things that i've been doing as part of this project is using this to do a whole bunch of mechanized proofs in proof assistance so we've taken uh, i've only been involved in some of these lots of other people have been working on this too but i had a series of papers on using these ideas from using types and functional programs to describe spaces to code in Agda and other proof assistants a lot of these kinds of theorems that you would find in a basic maybe graduate level course on algebraic topology. And the proofs are very clean and high level and abstract away from a lot of the details that you'll find in kind of typical proofs of these kinds of theorems because we're writing functional programs that sort of get at the essence of what's going on with these spaces. Okay, but what I wanna talk about today is um, more generally looking at how these connections influence programming because it's cool for me, as someone who's interested in doing these mechanized proofs, that we can use these tools to do mechanized proofs. And one of the things that I really like about this project is that it's connecting up people who work on functional programming or dependent type theory and people who work on mathematics or philosophy. And so just in the same way that you know, we're seeing more and more adoption of functional programming in the software industry, 
now there's a whole lot more mathematicians and philosophers who are interested in type theory and by extension functional programming than there were a few years ago. so i like how this project is kind of connecting these different areas of research but the thing that i want to focus on today is not that aspect of it which is sort of about using functional programming to do mathematics but to think about what all of this means in programming terms and what if anything we can learn about programming from these mathematical structures okay so that's the goal for today all right before I do that, I want to get you in the right frame of mind to understand what homotopy type theory is. And I'm going to do that with the help of this guy. Uh -oh. So this guy, you probably don't recognize because his name is Don LaFontaine, and he's actually a voice actor. And he does voiceovers for movies. Okay. In particular, he's famous for a particular style of movie trailer, right? the advertisements that announce movies. And some examples are uh, Goodfellas, Jacob the Liar, and the 2001, I think, remake of Planet of the Apes. Okay. Now, what is this guy doing when he does the movie trailers. There was this style of movie trailer that was very popular in the 90s, which had kind of a clumsy way of introducing what the movie was about. Okay, And there were a whole bunch of different movie trailers that kind of used the same thing, so much so that it became a cliche. So what was the meme? It was that I can't really do the guy's voice. It's a very rich baritone, and my voice is too high. I thought by now I might have my usual conference cold, which is the only time I can get down into those registers. Um, but so the kind of thing that's in the trailer is in a world that's powered by violence, or in a world where owning a radio was strictly forbidden, or in a world where freedom is history. OK, so this, you know, you can find a YouTube clip that goes through a lot of different movies that have this kind of trailer. So what does this have to do with anything? Well, I like this phrase, in a world, because for me, it's kind of what's going on in the back of my head when I think about denotational semantics. OK? In a world where all functions are monotone and preserve least upper bounds, is kind of the trailer for Dana Scott's seminal work on interpretation of lambda calculus in CPOs. Okay? And the thing that I want you to appreciate about this in a world phrase is that if you're used to thinking about programs as only existing in sets, right? A type is a set of values, and functions just transform those sets of values, you're going to have to get out of that way of thinking for today. And I claim that you're already pretty used to getting out of that way of thinking, because really, even recursive programs are not sets. They're in a different world. They're in CPOs. OK, so now if we try to fill in the ellipses, what is it about being in a world where all functions are monotone and preserve least upper bounds? What is it about being in a world where all functions are continuous that gives you some leverage? Well, there's two things that I need to say, because it's going to lead into our understanding of homotopy type theory. The first is that when you have a semantics of lambda calculus in CPOs or something like that, you're in a world where all functions are continuous. That means that if you write down a lambda term, lambda f, lambda x, lambda y, whatever, it gets interpreted as a function that has the property of being continuous. right? That's just the definition. You're in a world where everything is continuous. So if you write down a function, you don't need to prove that it's continuous. Okay. The way I'm going to phrase this is that the function is sort of secretly continuous. Okay. What do I mean by secretly? I mean you write down func something that looks as if it would be what you would write as down here as just the map from the elements of the partial order to the elements of the partial order. It's a function that takes f and x and y, 
and returns f applied to x, y, or whatever. Right? You're not doing the proof. So if you were to write this down here, you would have to do the proof that that function is continuous. It's monotone. It preserves least upper bounds, right? along with writing the function. But when you're writing down something in the lambda calculus, because you're in a world where all functions are continuous, you've packaged together the proof that it's continuous with the function itself. Okay. So the function itself, because it exists in this world where all things are continuous, has the property of being continuous. OK, so that's point one. Point two, and this is just a review of basic denotational semantics, is that when you're in a world where all functions are continuous, you can add principles that only exist in such a world. For example, you can say that for any functional, you have a fixed point, yf equals f of yf. That doesn't make sense in other worlds, but it does make sense in this world. Okay, so does this idea make sense? We want to be careful to make sure that we understand we're not in sets, we're in some other world. Okay. The key thing that's going to be important to understanding homotopy type theory is that we're going to move from considering worlds where all functions secretly are something to worlds where all functions secretly do something. Okay? When we think about CPOs or something like that, every function has the property that it preserves the partial order, it's monotone. Here, in the kinds of semantics we're going to consider, it's not that all functions secretly are something, it's that they secretly, in the same sense that it's packaged together in the very fact that you wrote the function itself, do something beyond just what it looks like the lambda should do. And of course, this is a familiar idea from all the work in this community on generic programming or getting code for free just by writing something in a certain setting. So I'm just recapitulating that and giving kind of a goofy spin on it. And once you have this idea that you can get code for free. Remember, when we're in CPOs, we can add the Y combinator. When we're in a language, in a setting, in a world, where we have these extra programs that come for free, one thing we can do is we can add principles that only make sense because of those extra programs. Okay. So you're going to have to keep these two things in mind as we try to digest what homotopy type theory is from a programming perspective. Okay? We're going to have some extra programs that come for free or generically with all of the functions we write down. And we're going to have some new operations that only exist in the presence of these extra programs. Okay, So let's dive in and do that. Well, homotopy type theory, in particular, is a world where types are spaces. And I like to draw this with kind of a cartoon of a torus or a donut or something like that. But the thing to keep in mind here is that what I really mean is that types are a structure. Each type is a structure that has points, like I've drawn the little circles there, and also paths, like I've drawn the line there. The points are going to be thought of as the programs that have that type. And two points can either be literally the same, that is, the points might be on top of each other, or they can be joined by a path. Now, the reason that you haven't really thought about types as spaces, this in a world where types are spaces before, is that for the most part, the types you're used to don't have any interesting paths. Natural numbers look like that. There's no paths. 4 is the same as 2 plus 2 is the same as 6 minus 2. There's no paths going on there. So we're going to have to get to some different types before we have interesting paths. But when we do, there's some things about paths which are they're going to, in a sense, look like a quality. In particular, at any point, there's a reflexivity path that stands still, 
there's a tr uh, symmetry path which says that if you can go from m to n this way, you can go backwards from n to m that way. And there's a transitivity path that says if you can go from m to n and then you can go from n to p, then there's a joined path that goes all the way from m to p. Okay, so in a sense, you can think about the paths as sort of an equivalence relation or an equality or something like that. But there's a gotcha. There's a thing you have to keep in mind, which is that paths are really data. They're not a predicate. They're not a check. They're not a property. They're structure on the type. In particular, you can have two different paths between the same two points. I can have one that goes sort of up around the hole and another that goes around the bottom of the hole. And these two paths might be not literally the same, right? They're not on top of each other. And they also might be not even connected by a path. Well, what does it mean to have a path between paths? That's what's called a homotopy or a continuous deformation that takes one path to another. Okay, So we can have different paths between the same two points, which is one way in which you can sort of think of this as describing data or structure or values or something like that, not predicates or checks or something that has no content. Okay, If you know some category theory, then everywhere I said path, replace it with morphism in a groupoid. Right? That's the high-powered way of saying what's going on here. But I want to kind of draw this, since I don't expect some category theory background today, you can also kind of understand it through the pictures here. OK, so what can we do with that? Well, remember I said we're in a world where all functions do something. The something that all functions are going to do is to act on paths. That is, whenever I have a function from one space to another, so think of f here as a function from the torus to the circle, f is going to not only take the points of the top space to the points of the bottom space. That is, it's not only going to take the points or programs in one to programs in the other. It's also going to secretly take paths in one space to paths in the other. And the reason I say secretly here is the same sense in which lambda f, lambda x, lambda y, whatever, was secretly continuous. right? You don't write down the action of the function on a path. What you write, and we'll see examples of this later in the talk, is something that looks a lot like just the code that acts on points. OK, so that's our setup. And now what I'd like to do is to explain one of these new principles that we add to type theory to get homotopy type theory. It's called Voivodsky's univalence axiom. But before I do that, what I want to do is to set up for that by kind of explaining to you what univalence does without mentioning univalence at all. And the example that I'll use to do that is going to have something to do with monads. I think it's actually in the ICFP bylaws that at least one invited speaker must mention the word monad. And with JavaScript and TensorFlow, I figured it fell to me. <laughs> OK. So here's a monad interface written out in Agda. OK. Well, what is it? It's a structure. It has a type constructor t. It has a return operation that embeds pure values in a computation. It has a sequencing operation that takes a computation and a continuation and makes a bigger continuation. The bigger continuation gets access to the value of the subcomputation, et cetera. If you're a dependently typed programmer, this looks kind of sparse to you because you think, well, I don't just want these operations. I also want some laws. OK, so in Agda, you would throw in the monad laws as part of the structure and use that as your spec for what this kind of notion of computation is. Now, after monads were already in use in Haskell and other functional languages for describing effects, there was a different notion of effectful computation 
called applicatives. And if you're not a Haskeller and aren't up on the latest of all of these different notions of computation, well, what an applicative is, is it has a pure, which is like return. That is, you can take a pure value and regard it as a computation that returns that value. And it has an effectful application, which takes a computation of a function and a computation of an argument and gives you a computation of a result. Okay? And the key difference here is that there are more applicatives than there are monads. Because for an applicative, the effects can influence the value, but not the structure of the computation. OK? So once again, we could throw the laws in here. right? There's a bunch of properties that these need to satisfy. And in a dependently typed language, that would go in the structure. OK, so now we've got these two notions of computation. Around, I think it was GHC 7.10, there was a change made in the standard libraries, right? Where before, monads did not have applicative as what's called a superclass. And after, monads did have applicative as what's called a superclass. Okay? When I, but if those words don't mean anything to you, that's okay. I'll kind of gesture at it on the slides here. What that change means, the way I'll render it in my Agda code here, is that we're going to take the interface, the specification for monad that we had before, which had return and bind and its laws. And we're going to add a new field to that interface to say that we also have an applicative. OK? Why does it make sense to make this change? Why is this not really breaking anything? It's because every monad is an applicative already, which we can express by adding laws that say that, oh, by the way, the pure is return. And since monads are a, have a, are a notion of computation that allows you to do more, in particular, you can implement the applicatives, applicative application by running the function, running the argument, and then applying them and returning the result. OK? So in a sense, we're extending the interface with a new operation. But in another sense, we're not really adding anything that wasn't, any, wasn't already there before. So what does it look like to rewrite code according to this change from one applicative, one monad interface or signature to another? Well, suppose you have some code that used the first interface. That is, you created an instance of monad for some particular type, and you uh, then, like, that would be one thing you might do in some client code. Another thing you might do is write some library function that's polymorphic that works for any monad instance, like sequencing a list of computations into a computation of a list. What do you do when you make this change? Well, to rewrite the code to work with the new interface, it's pretty clear and pretty boring how you're supposed to adapt it. If before you created an instance of the old interface, then now you insert the default implementation that the laws prescribe must hold for the applicative functions. If you instead used an instance of the old interface, like in the sequence function here, then instead what you can do is you can still refer to the bind and the return of the monad because you've extended the interface with a new operation. And so in particular, all of the old operations are still there. OK? So this is pretty boring adapter code to write. And in particular, we can sort of argue that there's a general sense in which you shouldn't have to write this more than once. OK? Why shouldn't you have to write this more than once? 
Well, what we're doing when we adapt code from one interface to the other is, on the one hand, we're saying that we can convert the classic interface for monad into an applicative implies monad by creating the default instance that the laws say must exist. On the other hand, we can say, if we have an instance of the new one, then, by the way, we also have an instance of the old one because, well, the new one is an extension of the old one. Okay, so if you're the kind of person whose eyes glaze over when someone says monad, then forget everything I just said and just think about your favorite instance of the general form of this situation. You have an interface. It has some operations f and g. You add a new operation h, which is determined by the others. h can be expressed in terms of f and g. Why might you do this? Well, for convenience, you might want this structure to be a substructure of some sort of something with an h in it. Or for efficiency, you might want to give implementers the license to implement h in some way that is the same as f and g, whatever the default implementation in terms of f and g in one sense, but actually in a computational sense, runs differently. OK? Now, there's a bijection between the two interfaces. That is, given an instance of one, we can create a default instance of the other by what do we do? We just define h to be whatever the spec says it must be. Given an instance of the extended one, we can convert it back to an instance of the original by just forgetting that h existed in the first place. And moreover, when we round trip those, that's the identity. OK? Why is that? Well, if we start with the small one, go to the big one and come back, then we still have f and g. If we start with the big one, go to the small one, and then come back, then the law that h is equal to the default implementation tells us that we got back where we started, at least up to a notion of propositional or provable equality. We don't get back exactly the same code. It would take different running times, maybe. But in terms of the kinds of behavioral reasoning that we do in type theory, we get back to where we started. Okay. So the key thing that you need to get out of this example, I wanted to motivate it with something that came up in Haskell recently, but the key thing to get out of the example is that we're in a situation where we have ways of interchanging these two types that compose to the identity. OK. Because of that, it's obvious how we apply this in context. right? If you're going through your program, every time you find an instance, you convert it. Every time you use the, uh, had a use of the old structure, you instead just project the f and g, right? It's boring. It's adapter code that we should be able to systematize. And indeed, we could do this wrapper as a dynamic coercion, or by sort of partially evaluating what that does, we could insert this code and then reduce it to kind of get the code you would have written if you by hand went through and changed all of the instances of these structures. OK, so if you understand this example, then you already have most of the ingredients to understand what univalence will do for us. Right? What univalence is going to do for us is one thing univalence is going to do for us is it's going to let us take this kind of I can map back and forth between the two interfaces and apply it in context in order to lift this bijection to any context. OK? We're going to write it out, but that's the idea. All right, so back to the chase. How does a mechanism inspired by higher categorical semantics and homotopy theory help us with writing glue code between different implementations of an interface. Well, the idea is that, remember we have this structure of paths 
we're in a world where we have this structure of paths on every type in type theory. What we're going to do is we're going to set things up so that a path between types does what we just said we wanted to do. Let's us mediate between the two different types in any context. OK, how does that work? Well, the first stumbling block that you have to get over for understanding this is that path-related types, that is, two types A and B that are joined by a line in the space of types like that, don't have the same elements. If A is sort of path equal to B, it's not the case that A and B, an element of A is the same as an element of B. What is the case is that there's a function from A to B determined by that path. And there's a function from B to A also determined by that path. And these are mutually inverse. That is, just like in the example of converting from one instance of an interface to an extended interface that we saw, monad, applicative implies monad, what happens is that you get, from a path, you get functions back and forth that compose to the identity. Which means that moving along a path might do some work. There might be computational content to applying a coercion, that's what the coe in the notation I'm using today stands for, coerce along a path, might actually do something. Which is good because in our motivating example, when we coerced from the shorter interface to the longer interface, we did some work to create a new instance of H in terms of F and G. Okay. So what the univalence axiom says is exactly the converse to this idea that path-related types induce bijections. If we're in a setting where path-related types induce bijections, then it makes sense to add the principle that, conversely, bijections induce paths. Okay. That's what's going to let us create a path between monad and applicative implies monad, or between nat tenth time string and string times nat. We'll be able to create paths by giving a bijection. Why does that make sense? Well, what we said is that when you have a bijection, then the univalence axiom says that that induces a path between the types A and B. Well, what did we just say we could do with paths? We said we can coerce along them. In particular, if you have a path between A and B, you get a coercion from A to B, and you get a coercion from B to A. Well, what do you suppose those coercions do? The top one does F and the bottom one does G, when F and G are the two sides of the bijection that we're putting in in the first place. That is, if we're in the setting where paths induce bijections, then we can add the converse principle that bijections induce paths, along with a reduction that says that what that does is apply the bijection that you gave. We're getting out what you put in. It's a beta reduction. OK. Now, how does this apply to our idea of converting between implementations of different interfaces? Well, remember, we're in a world where functions secretly act on paths. Well, before that, they act on points, but they're going to secretly act on paths. So the action of a function on points, let's think of, in particular, the function in question is a type constructor. Then the action of the function on points is going to be the idea that from types A and B, you can make a bigger type A or B. Right? That's the part that's familiar, not secret. What's the part that's secret 
the part that's secret is that we're going to be in a world where we have a generic program that says that not only do functions act on points, but also on paths. In particular, we said that a path between types has to induce a bijection, which means that if we have a path from the type A to the type A prime, and a path from the type B to the type B prime, then we get a path from the type A or B to the path type A prime or B prime. And you know how this goes already. What do you do if you have coercions between A and A prime, coercions between B and B prime, and you want coercions between functions? Then I'll just do one direction. If you're going from here to here, you're given a function from A's to B's. You have a function from A prime to A by going backwards along alpha. You have a function from B to B prime by going forwards along beta. You wrap the function you're given with pre and post composition with the coercions you're given. That gives you the new coercion function. Okay? So this is what I mean by type constructors, functions secretly acting on paths. What I mean is that the arrow type itself is going to come equipped with this ability to make this transformation. Okay? With those two ingredients, we can now go back to our running example. Suppose that I wrote instance, an instance of the one interface, and now I want to move it to an instance of the extended interface, right? I'm starting with an F and a G. I'm adding an H defined in terms of F and G. I'm starting with a, the classic monad interface. I'm adding an applicative instance to it. Well, what we have is a bijection between the two interface types, right? That's the thing we said. If you have short interface, long interface, you have a bijection between short interface and long interface. By univalence, that bijection determines a path between those two types. Monad and applicative implies monad. All types, all functions, secretly act on paths, which means that if we have a path here, then whenever we write down a type, it will act on it. What type am I going to write down? I'm going to write down the type that describes the components of the client code parameterized by the thing I want to change. The thing I want to change is monad into applicative implies monad, or short interface into long interface. The type of the client code with, whole, with a hole for that is, well, there's an instance for maybe, or sorry, let me back up. There's an instance for maybe, and there's a sequence function that's polymorphic in an instance for some type t. Right? That's just the shape of the code that we wrote, which was using this interface. Because that function acts on paths, because all functions act on paths, that's the point of the world we're in, that function c acts on this path to produce a path C applied to U A of D between C of monad and C of applicative implies monad. What does it do? Well, we said how you run cohorts. What do you what can you do with a path from C of monad to C of applicative implies monad? You can coerce along it. What does it do when you coerce along it? Well, we said what happens when you coerce along univalence. We said what happens when you coerce in a function type. You wrap it with pre and post conditions. There are similar rules for all of the other types. And so it does something like that. In particular, at a hand wavy level, what it does is 
it looks for the spot in the place in this spots in this template where the type constructor occurs and applies the bijection you provided at those particular spots. Okay? So in particular, if we apply this coercion function defined by using the action on paths of C to get from monad to applicative implies monad to the code we started with, then we get the code you would have rewritten it to by hand, at least up to propositional equality. When you go through and you find an instance, you rewrite it by inserting the default implementation. When you go through and you find, sorry, there's a thing for that. You rewrite it by applying the default implementation that's coercing along the path we gave. When you go through and you uh, find a use, then you coerce in the other direction along the equivalence, right? We go through and we find the spots where it occurs. If it's contravariant, we coerce one way. If it's covariant, we coerce the other. And then we get the code we would have written, OK? So remember, the whole point was we're in a world where all functions secretly do something, right? We get generic programs. We add new principles that depend on them. Univalence is an instance of that where we're in a world where all functions act on paths, and paths between types induce bijections. Because of that, you can add the principle that bijections induce paths. And therefore, what you get is the ability to lift any bijection by this generic program. OK, that's the key idea. That's my trailer for univalence. Now, of course, this is only interesting if there's interesting types in this world. Well, there are. In fact, this works for all of the basic type formers of dependent types, pi, sigmas, paths, inductive, co-inductive, sums, et cetera. And of course, showing you how this works for simple function types is the easiest thing I could have done, right? The real interesting thing here is when we get into dependent types. It's not that hard to write a library that pushes bijections through dependent types by all of the many generic programming techniques that we have in this community. It gets a lot harder when you get to the dependent types. It doesn't work for, this is a good thing to keep in mind in case you're confused about it, things like intersection types where you would demand that literally the same program is in two different types. That's not stable under bijection. Or things like intentional type analysis, where you case analyze a type and say, are you really a product? Right? That's not also not stable under bijection, because it might not be that. These aren't problems, because you can handle intersection types as predicates. You can handle intentional analysis by defining a type of codes for types, like we did in uh, PLMW on Sunday, if you were there. OK. It's also only interesting if there's interesting bijections to feed into this generic program. Well, there's a lot of those that come up in dependently typed programming, and even in simply typed programming. You might have multiple different implementations of the same concept, like lists or join lists, modulo, associativity, and unit. You might have different implementations of the same interface, where by interface I mean Picture you have collections with map and reduce and nth and all of those kinds of functions. Here you'll get a little bit of parametricity, in particular parametricity for graphs of bijections. There's other kinds of bijections that come up a lot in dependently type programming, forgetting about some refinement or kind of functional versus data representations of tuples. And there's other bijections that come up in uh, it's kind of a hard thing to sort of like enumerate a sufficiently compelling list of. But if you start looking at some hot libraries and some formalizations, these things come up in a lot of places. OK. So why was this a hard problem? Right? You may have heard that like computing with univalence was an interesting question that people have been working on for a while. Well, it's really this idea that paths are data. right? And there are these homotopies between paths. And because of that, there's this kind of higher dimensional spin-off when you try to push the induction through in giving the kind of computational interpretation that I just showed you. 
So if you understood how to do it for like simple function types and things like that, when you try to push the induction through in general, it gets more complicated, which has led to the development of things called cubical type theories, which resulted from some cubical sets models of homotopy type theory by Thierry Cocond and uh, Mark Besom, Simon Huber. And then, so this was in about 2013. And then a bunch of people kind of started to look at these semantics and try to figure out what they mean as a type theory. And it's the kind of thing where there's a lot of different variations and there's a lot of different possibilities that are being explored. There's one by Cohen, Cocond, Huber, and Mortberg that's implemented and really gives you a full computational interpretation of all of univalence. There's a lot of other people, myself included, pushing on different ways of arranging the cubes and different ways of thinking about these things. Uh, Carlo Anguilli, Bob Harper, and Todd Wilson are looking at a new Perl or computational type theory perspective on these sorts of things rather than a kind of formal type theory perspective on these sorts of things. So this is a big research topic in homotopy type theory right now. The main idea, which I'll just gesture at in pictures for you, is that you generalize this coercion operation that I've been talking about today to an operation of if you have three sides of a square, you get a fourth side. That's like identity and composition of paths or sorry, uh, inverse and composition of paths. Or if you have all sides but one of a cube, then you get the missing side. Okay, And figuring out a nice way to formulate these operations is important for pushing this sort of computational interpretation that I showed you the first step of through to higher dimensions. Okay. So the final thing I want to do in the last few minutes here is to talk about what else you can do besides just thinking about univalence, right? If the whole game were just, well, we have a type of bijections, then you know that's something, but it's not that much. So the thing you can do, which is really the key to that code I had on the slide at the beginning of the talk about formalizing homotopy theory is not only is there a built-in type that has these non-trivial paths, bijections are paths, but you can also define your own. So we had a paper a few years ago at ICFP, which I like to use to introduce this idea, of modeling patches in a version control system as paths. The idea being you create a type where the points are like types of repositories. So for example, I might have a point here that describes documents with n characters was the simple thing we were doing in the paper. And then the you might have some other types of repositories there. And then the paths in this type, what those represent, are patches or edits that go from one repository to another. So here I've got a patch swap A with B at position I that uh, relates documents of length N to documents of length N. And what it does is it's syntax, it's a data element of my data type that says edit the character at position I to be, if it's A, then B, or if it's B, then A. Okay? And because we're working in a setting where all types have paths, and paths have identity inverse and composition, what you get out of this is you define your domain-specific little data type with these generators, and you get the idea that you have no-op patches and undos and uh, composition of patches as something the framework gives you. And you can go one level higher and put in not just paths, but squares or paths between paths, which correspond to laws that you might want your patches to satisfy. For example, you might want to say that if I edit two characters, swap two characters at position I, or I, and then I swap two characters at position J, that's the same as doing it in the opposite order because those two edits don't interfere. So we have patches as paths and laws as squares. 
this is the kind of type we can write down in homotopy type theory, where we say we have a space with the points as points, the paths as paths, and the squares as squares. So it turns into code. And then when you have a type like this described by generators for points and paths, in order to map it into something, remember, we're in a world where functions act on paths. We don't just have to send the points somewhere. We have to send the paths somewhere. So the points here would go to, for example, types, if we're writing an interpreter that interprets our patches as actual code. The paths would go to bijections, such that the laws actually hold for the bijections we pick. So what that looks like as a piece of code is that we'll write an interp function. It takes the points of our patch theory to uh, types. It takes the paths to the univalence axiom used to turn a bijection between the actual implementation types into a path in between types, and then verifies that these have the laws. So the framework of a higher inductive type is giving you identities, inverses, compositions, no ops, undoes, compositions, but forcing you to act on not only the points and the paths when you write an implementation. So it's organizing or structuring the implementation of these patch theories. OK. So just to wrap up, what I hope you've gotten out of today's talk is, first of all, this idea that there's a connection between dependent type theory, which underlies lots of proof assistance programming languages that we're studying in this community, and these things that I've drawn with kind of cartoons of points and paths and things like that, which are really st objects called homotopy types or groupoids or higher dimensional groupoids once you start to think about paths between paths and structures like that. And because of this, we've gotten some new principles like univalence, which I wanted to spend a lot of time discussing how univalence is interpreted by being in a setting where paths induce bijections and functions act on paths. And therefore, we can add the principle that bijections induce paths, which we run by way of this generic program. And then I briefly hinted at how you can put this to use by defining your own data types that have paths, non-trivial paths in them, and then run these things using univalence. But big picture, I think, one of the lessons of this work is not just the specific things, univalence and higher inductive types and things like that that we've found so far, but this idea of moving from semantics where all functions are something to semantics where all functions do something, right? We can equip types with extra structure. There's a variety of structures out there in the realm of category theory, higher category theory, homotopy theory, which can be turned into different generic programs. So one of the things that I've been working on recently is an idea about directed type theory, where you drop the idea that all paths have inverses and get different generic programs out of it. Okay? So there's this whole space of models in these kinds of settings which suggest different things we can equip our types with. And I think that's a fruitful area for investigation. OK, thank you for listening. Questions? Well, in the back. Hi, uh, Ren Romano from Google. Uh, so I was wondering if you could give some intuition for why one should believe univalence. You know, why should we believe that paths are no more than just bijections? Well, the technical way to justify it is that there are 
several different mathematical models, one given by Voivodsky in what's called simplicial sets, where, I mean, in fact, I was like completely lying in saying that they're bijections <laughs> because they're actually something that's like a bijection up to homotopy, but right, for right. the examples we saw, like we don't need to get into that. But um, I mean, it's a thing that, it's a notion that specializes to bijection in the cases we were talking about today, so I hid the more complicated thing from you. But um, so yeah, I mean, there's those semantics. There's also semantics, the, the constructive semantics by Kokand, which justifies it. So that's kind of the, you know, if you're a kind of person who likes things to be justified by operational semantics, then we have that kind of justification. If you're the kind of thing who likes, person who likes things to be justified by denotational semantics, then there's that kind of justification. Hi, uh, Derek Dreyer. Uh, oh, I'm over here. <laughs> uh, Derek Dreyer, uh, yeah. Max Planck Institute. Um, so you motivated things with this, uh, you motivated the univalence with uh, the example of the monad, uh, switching back and forth between yeah. monad and applicative uh -huh. monad. So I'm trying to get this, I'm trying to understand this from a programmer's perspective. Yeah. Um, because, the, right, there's the issue that when you when you go back, when you go from applicative implies monad to the other one and back, yeah. you lose your efficient implementation. Right. You might have had. But I think if you write out a, so like remember the shape of the client code had things either in covariant position or in contravariant position, right, which will either insert the default implementation if you didn't have one or project it away if you did. The round trip is really only going to happen in proofs. And so this is saying ah. that in proof, well, it'll happen in paths, which for the, our purposes are probably just in proofs, which means that in a proof, you know that the default implementation is the same as the efficient implementation because you've got the law that says that behaviorally that's true. Okay, so I guess that's the part I missed is exactly yeah. how you sort yeah. of distinguish the in proofs part uh, from. Uh, well, I mean, it's not formally distinguished, but if you think of dependent types as only being proofs, I mean, so in a hot setting, it's not actually going to, like you could, yeah, in a hot setting, you could end up doing that round trip in a path. The question is, if your paths are only used, f are, you know, like if it, in that kind of example, your paths would only be used for verification, in which case it would only be in something that's called a HPROP or a irrelevant type. Okay. Yeah. Michael Arnzenius, um, University of Birmingham. So this idea of coercing along bijections sounds very interesting from a practical perspective because it would be nice to take code that's written against a very inefficient implementation of something and then coerce it without its knowledge uh, into something written against a very mm -hmm. efficient implementation. Yeah. Um, but uh, this brings up the question of whether the coercion itself introduces inefficiencies. So yeah. I does mean, it? <laughs> right. Is there any so, work on efficiency of coercion? Not yet. I mean, there's just barely an operational semantic. So I mean, I think something that's in the queue is sort of thinking about what it means to do that efficient, like you would want to use a lot of the techniques of fusion and things like that to sort of optimize these sorts of things. As far as I know, no one's looked at that in this context yet. Hi, Jeremy Gibbons from the University of Oxford. Uh, thank you, that was a, a, a brilliantly clear explanation of coercion through bijections, sort of changes of data representation where they're bijections, but many uh, changes of data representation are not bijections. Yeah. That, is that the directed type theory? Yeah, thing? so I, let me go to the slide. So, so, so I'm well, very interested to see what kind of mileage you get out yeah. of that and whether it yeah. works there. So, a lot of, so one of the things that you know, I found frustrating is that many of the things we want to do in computer science don't actually fit into the symmetric framework, which I attribute to sort of times arrow or something like that. Like functions compute, processes evolve, there's a directedness to computation that doesn't show up as much in the mathematical examples. So in a directed type theory, you could have a universe of types and functions or types and retractions, which would give you something like views. And then you get the same kind of pushing things through. So that's sort of what I was gesturing at in saying that there's these other related models that would have different generic programs. One last question, yes. In a world yeah. where types are this rich, yeah. Is there a place for the programmer to retain the idea that data is fundamentally untyped and that types are just an ascription to untyped data? 
I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot of the examples we were doing, you know, like the leverage here came from knowing that the type, right, like we're not using the type just as a classifier here, we're also using it as a guide to write code. When we wrote that function C that said how to lift this bijection through things, it was that C that was determining the computation. So you at least need that, whether you check them at compile time or not. I don't know, I haven't thought about anything like that. Okay. Yeah. We'll uh, do that on offline. Thank you. Thanks.